that's a big bad. That's a big fish. Yeah. Oh, holy moly. Look at the size of this. Look at the size of this fish. Oh, my goodness. Oh, and he pops off. This one's legal for sure. That's like a freaking fusion cabazon leg. Oh my god. That's a monster. That's crazy, dude. That's like an entire octopus and its tummy. And look at the size of this toad. What a toad. Oh my god. Hey, what is going on, everyone? I hope you all have been safe and well. Today, I'm going to chronicle a trip that we did to the Central Coast, which is absolutely one of my favorite destinations. Now, I should let you know that while there are some pretty cool fish catching action sequences, most of my footage is kind of geared toward the sharing of knowledge. So let me start with a quick time lapse video, which will illustrate just how drastically the scenery will change in a span of four short hours. Now I know California is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but this is pretty amazing to me. Getting ready to uh, launch, um, paid homage to Poseidon, the uh, god of <laughs> god of the sea, and um, hope for a nice and easy launch and a good day fishing. So launching into the surf is kind of like controlled chaos. You have to be patient, 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 uh, remain calm, but when you decide to go, you have to be super decisive and, and just go full bore. And um, probably the most important thing is to never be stationary at any point for any length of time. Okay, you have to generate momentum going in and then you just gotta power through stuff. Now, I should let you know that all of these action cameras have a tendency to flatten stuff out and make everything seem mellow. So if you're rock climbing, for example, the grade doesn't seem quite as steep. If you're doing water sports, the swells don't look quite as big, etc. And of course, watching something on the PC or TV is different than being there in real life and having to suffer real consequences if something goes sideways. After this one. Yep. Here we go. So as I emphasized, the key is to always be moving, always have conviction, and never be a sitting duck. This time that a little bit. Could have been could have been smoother. Could have been drier. Anyways, um, but I'm glad you, you guys got to see, or gals got to see that footage because, you know, it's not the smoothest launch, but you got to be ready for stuff like that. And, um, and the point is, you just got to be decisive and go. And again, you cannot be a sitting duck for any length of time, for any length of time, because indecision and being static We'll get you jacked up. So from an onlooker's perspective, it's going to look something like this. Now, I've seen launches where people will stop their kayaks here and then at that point they will sit on their kayaks and become a sitting duck and what they're waiting for is a wave to pick them up yeah a wave will pick you up and possibly turn you sideways and at that point it becomes a dumpster fire because if your kayak gets parallel to the surf um, all kinds of bad things can happen like an involuntary garage sale Got the uh, Hulk launching. Just all around, just great human being. Um, very, very team oriented. Uh, I, you know, we get spoiled by his generosity and uh, his his 
teamness, if you will, on every trip. So yeah, just a great person to have with you at, on any kind of trip. So it looks like his launch is going pretty smoothly as well. This is MRAD. I never use real names. I, I believe in privacy, but this is MRAD. And MRAD was the winner of my invitation to come fish the opener. Keep going, keep going. Get past that a little bit more, a little bit more. <laughs> And um, that trip did not go because the conditions did not allow for it. So I gave him a rain check and he decided to join me on this trip. Uh, let me be very, very, very clear and explicit. This is not a newbie trip, okay? Um, this area, the oceanic conditions uh, can really jack you up if you, if you don't know what you're doing. So again, this is not a newbie trip. Um, but MRAD struck me as a capable guy and he looks like he's doing fine. Okay, so, I mean, we're literally, what, 150 yards off the launch and this is the central coast, right? So if we were at Ritondo Beach or Marina, Marina Del Rey, we could probably spend all day here, but this is not why we came to the central coast. Okay, this, like, nothing is flat and you're gonna see stuff like that all day long but this is not why we came here um, hopefully I can show you why we uh, we drove four hours so here when you see kind of like schoolish marks like that you know, mid column typically it means blue rockfish and so that formation right there isn't packed tightly enough and there aren't enough of them to be like mackerel um, but blue rockfish act atypically from other rockfish. You can often find them mid-column and they are super aggressive and um, according to my palate they are just as tasty as, as any other rockfish maybe besides cabazon. Okay, try to drop over here. There we go. This is an okay fish, it's not anything big. Guys, I've got good marks over here. Yeah, I'm heading over to you right now. So yeah, this is this is a decent fish. This is kind of like a lighter rod, so uh, you know it's not bad. But the bend in the rod it, it's a little bit deceiving because this is kind of like a medium heavy rod. And right there is a really good example of why you want a longer rod, right? If you have a rod that's like seven to eight foot, you can easily pass the tip of the rod from one side of the bow to the other. With rockfish, it doesn't really make that big of a difference because they're vertical fighters. But um, if you're fighting a better fish, then yeah, this is a nice blue actually. Got foul hooked, unfortunately. But um, we're gonna keep couple for the fish fry so um yeah and we we'll keep hunting for the big ones so drop and then yeah you gotta be ready because they'll they're aggressive fish that'll pick up stuff on the drop so uh well this is an olive rock fish so you know not a bad fish we're gonna let this guy go um yeah we're gonna let this guy go dropping so I have a pretty good idea of how long it should take to drop down. But if it just, for whatever reason, stops falling, just swing on them. Swings are free. So that fish was picked up around here. As you can see, um, or as I've mentioned, blue rockfish can act very atypically. So you can find a mid-column and they're pretty thick over here. So you could easily limit out. Um, not exactly the quarry that we're after, but we might pick up a few here just for the fish fry. So back in Redondo, when you see that, that typically means calico. Over here, it means blue rockfish. Similar size, similar shape of fish. So yeah. So let me describe to you guys and gals how I target mid-column fish, like this pattern of either blue rockfish and or olive rockfish. 
So my fish TV is telling me that they are appearing from about, I don't know, 50 feet all the way down to pretty much the bottom. So what I'm gonna do is, and I'm ex almost exclusively a jig fisherman. So I will drop my jig and because I think most fish hunt or look for food looking up, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop it down to maybe about 45 feet. And then I'll stop and then I'll jig a few times. If I don't get hit, I will drop the lure another five feet and then I'll jig it a few times. If I don't get hit, I will rinse and repeat. And generally speaking, when you see a cluster of fish this size, mid column, you're gonna get picked up. It's almost inevitable. Um, in terms of jig size, the ballpark figure is maybe one ounce for like 20 feet of water. So if you're in 40 feet of water, maybe two ounce jig. If you're in 80 feet of water, maybe like a four ounce jig, etc. And so a question might be, well, how do I know where my jig is in the water column? Okay, and that goes back to the A-scope. And again, I'm gonna have footage of the A-scope in action a little bit later. So the A-scope is this column on the far right hand side. And if you have the A-scope turned on and your fish finder is reasonably sensitive, you will see your jig descending. So you will watch it drop to about 45 feet, at which point you will engage your spool or whatever you call it, and then start jigging. Sometimes the fish are going to be in a really hungry mood and they will be super aggressive. So you may not have time to drop your jig down to 45, 50 feet, nor will you have to impart any kind of jigging action. It may be the case where your jig falls 30 feet and one of these fish or several of these fish go up and get the jig. So in your mind, you have a reasonable idea of how quickly your jig is going to fall. So maybe like a two ounce erratic fall jig is gonna fall at, I don't know, like four feet per second. So then you know that it should take roughly 10 seconds for your jig to get down to about 40 feet. So if your jig stops falling at five seconds and the line goes slack, chances are a fish has picked up your lure. You wanna swing at that moment because as I mentioned, swings are free. This isn't like live bait fishing where you have to be patient and you have to wait for the fish to swallow the bait. Just swing on them. Hey guys, why don't we go like four wide so that um, each one of us is covering a different depth, right? So maybe you'd be kind of like lateral, but I don't know, like 50 feet apart as we go north. Sounds good. So what's being talked about here is our paddling or pedaling pattern, right? So when we started fishing, we would all kind of like be clustered together, kind of like mama duck and baby ducks. And in this pattern, we're all going over the same patch of water. Um, this is pointless, especially if everyone has a fish finder, right? So the pattern that I'm talking about here is everyone is kind of together but we're doing the west coast spread offense where we are all kind of apart by 50 feet or whatever and so everyone is pedaling over new ground so real quick uh, gear lexa 400 here let me take a quick minute to describe the gear that we are using and more specifically the reel the reel that you're looking at is a Daiwa Lexa reel. And I'm gonna leave links to all this gear in the description. And they are affiliate links. So quickly, what an affiliate link is, if you click through and purchase, you don't pay a penny more. Um, but I get like a small commission or something like that. So it's a win-win situation. So anyways, uh, we were a party of four and there must have been, I don't know, maybe nine of these Daiwa Lexa reels. Now, let me state that no one pays me anything to shill their gear. I mean, I have like 2,600 subs, so no one's going to pay me anything to uh, shill their gear for them on YouTube. So therefore, I can give you an unbiased opinion as to why everyone in our party and a whole bunch of other people like these Daiwa Alexa reels. And there are others like this, like Okuma has a, a line called Komodo. But the point is, 
I don't think that there's a better, more versatile reel for this kind of fishing than a low profile bait caster reel. And this is the 400 size. So if you're fishing anywhere from like 30 feet of water to 300 feet of water, I don't think you can beat the low profile bait caster. Because it is low profile, it's going to feel ergonomically pretty good and it's not going to want to twist in your hand. Because of this level wind feature, you don't have to worry about using your left thumb or your right thumb to lay down the line nicely. But most importantly, if you're doing the top down fishing like I described, no other type of reel makes it easier for you to feed or take up line in like let's say five foot increments than this type of reel if you want to drop the line or your jig five feet just depress this what do you call it thumb bar and line goes out if you want to pick up line just turn the handle and it'll auto engage the spool and it'll pick up line this is uh, a swim bait rod seven six 15 to 30 pound as far as the rod goes, I don't think it's nearly as impactful as the type of reel, but I'm going to kind of describe to you what I like. So first of all, in terms of the length, you want something between 7 and 8 foot so that you can pass the tip of the rod from one side of the bow to the other. If I had to choose one size, it would be like 7 foot 6 inches. In terms of line rating, I would probably do minimum 15 to 30 pound because again, if you're going to target big fish, you might run into like a 15, 20, 25 pound ling. You never know. Um, if you're going to target big fish in deep water with heavy torpedo sinkers like 8, 10 ounces, um, you're probably going to want a rod that's rated to be heavy. The one feature that I like personally, and I don't think everyone shares my, my view on this. I like this section right here, the butt section, to be longer and be comfortable because I like tucking this underneath my arm when I'm fighting a fish. If I have a rod with a shorter butt section, okay, the, the edge of the butt or the end of the butt is gonna dig into my, my underarm and annoy me. And more importantly, it will not allow me to apply leverage to a fish when I'm fighting it or when I'm trying to pick up 12 ounces of lead from 250, 300 feet. Um, we're in water and that's like 90 feet, so I'm gonna throw something kind of heavy like six ounces and again my approach is to drop down with something big like this and look for the biggest bully in the bunch and if nothing bites then uh, I will downsize. In terms of bait as I mentioned I'm strictly an artificial guy on that particular weekend all the big fish that we picked up if you watch my video or Cheeto's video were picked up on big plastics so some kind of lead head and a big plastic, like six, seven inches. This is interesting to me. So obviously a big mound of some kind. And you got some fish up here. We will be hitting this spot on the way back. So we went from about 80 feet of water to, what is it, like 50, 51. So that's going to get my attention for sure. The other kind of pattern that we are looking for, especially if you're chasing bigger fish like ling or cabazon, is something kind of bumpy, you know, hilly or dippy. Assuming that there isn't like a 400 foot shipwreck or a giant reef around, you're looking for changes in elevation. And those changes, even if they're kind of subtle, maybe even 20, 30 feet, it's gonna hold fish over a completely flat area. Better. I'm kind of hoping that whatever bites that, that big old jig or whatever is going to be an interesting fish. We'll see. Nah, not that interesting. Johnny bass or a copper or whatever. Better fish. And big uh, plastic. Better fish. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Yeah, they're liking the plastics today. It's another decent fish. 
might, might not be legal, but yeah, string the plastics. Yeah, this guy's gonna be shy too, but that's what they're liking. <laughs> we got a lot of grunting. I think we got a big one. Holy moly! Holy moly, what a monster! Wow! What a monster! That is a ginormous red. Out of boy, Cheeto. Big in. Alright, it's time for this dog to start hunting. You know what I'm saying? Here we go, down the hatch. There we go. Now we're talking. Also, I want to take a little bit of time to give a quick shout out to Blacktail Hooks. Uh, the Hulk made a connection with them, and he tells me that they're good people, good friendly people making uh, good quality stuff. So, shout out to Blacktail. So one feature that I really like to have on my 2D sonar is the A-scope, which is the band right here. So let me take the time to elaborate on what the A-scope does. It performs three really important functions um, as far as I'm concerned. So when I say band, I am talking about this column here on the far right side. And so this is the A-scope and it shows what is underneath your boat or a kayak right now. So you have to understand that this stuff off to the left, it's constantly scrolling. So this stuff off to the left is stuff that you've gone by already. And the A-scope column or band is what is underneath your boat right now. And what it shows you is um, what's right underneath your boat. And maybe just as importantly, it shows you here now zoom in see that number 11 it shows you the diameter of your sonar cone um, so if you want to adjust the diameter of your sonar cone what you can do is you can go uh, menu and then you can go to beam width here 24 and so if you make that uh, a smaller number it's going to be a smaller angle or, or a sharper angle resulting in a smaller cone if you make it a larger number, then it's going to be a larger diameter cone. We're in shallow water, we're like 21 feet, so I want that, that beam angle to be as wide as possible. Now, if we get out to like 100 feet, I may have to adjust that because, again, I want a cone diameter that's manageable. Here, let me take the time to describe beam angles and cone diameter sizes because it's going to vary depending on how deep you're fishing. So. If you are fishing in 30 feet of water, you want the beam angle, as denoted here in green, to be as wide as possible. If you have a very narrow beam angle, the cone diameter is going to be useless. It might be like 4 feet or 5 feet. So in shallow water, you want the beam angle to be as wide as possible so that your cone diameter is as wide as possible. But if you're fishing in 300 feet of water and you use that same wide beam angle by the time the beam hits the uh, bottom at 300 feet it's going to be absolutely ginormous it could be i don't know like 400 feet 500 feet and you can't make heads nor tails out of that kind of stuff so in deeper water you want the beam angle to be very narrow so when it reaches the uh, seafloor you have a manageable cone diameter size so that's how that works so the a scope will show your jig descending so that's another good way to keep it from getting snagged right maybe stop it before it hits the uh, bottom here i want to take some time and hopefully save you some grief and some gear the great thing about the central coast is nothing is flat the bad thing about the central coast is nothing is flat. So the bottom is very sticky. So even if you kind of know what you're doing, you're going to lose gear. Okay. Uh, to minimize gear loss, make use of your A scope here. So right here, you can see where the jig is and how it is descending. And you can say that the seafloor is like 75 feet. So just keep your eyes on the descent of the jig and maybe stop it at around 70 
and then start your jigging process from there. It's no guarantee that you're not gonna lose gear, but it may save you some gear. And then also having a line counter reel may help as well. So the Garmin unit that I run has the built-in contour line. And a contour line denotes the depth. Okay, so think of every one of these lines as like a stair step, right? And when you have stairs that are packed really tight together, like right here, that means it's gonna be a steep incline or a steep decline. So if you look at the numbers, you're going from like what a buck 32 to 45 or something like that. So basically, you're looking at an underwater mountain, and one side of that mountain is very steep, and the other side of the mountain is not very steep. So, whenever I see big significant changes in elevation, uh, that's going to draw my attention. So, this is this area right here is an area that I want to check out. That's a big bed. That's a big fish. Yeah. Oh, holy moly! Look at the size of this. Look at the size of this fish. Oh my goodness. Oh, and he pops off! This one's legal for sure. That's like a freaking fusion cavazon link. Oh my god. That's a monster. That's crazy, dude. That's like an entire octopus and its tummy. And look at the size of this toad. What a toad. Oh my god. Out of nowhere. Like eight to ten foot swells. This is interesting. So as I mentioned, all of these action cams have a tendency to flatten everything out and they never really accurately depict how big the swells are. So let me give you another visual that will probably do a better job of relaying exactly what we are feeling. Again, not a newbie friendly place. Yeah, like like eight, 10 foot swells. These bumps, that's not structure. That's, those are the swells talking. Look at this. Okay, the playing was hell on earth, but look at this. It looks absolutely delicious. This is the man at work. Catch a fish, cook fish, and that looks absolutely delectable. All right, here we go. Um, we're collabing with uh, casting with Kaneo with a K, right? Yeah. Okay, so. He's doing just an outstanding job with the playing, and um, they went poke polling, and they caught a monkey face deal. I've always thought that poke polling, that's what you call it, right? And this is uh, Koa, by the way. Um, always found it very interesting. This is the future um, of fishing, and this is the next generation. Wow, I, I think this is my longest video to date, um, but you and I had a lot to catch up on. So if you have stayed with me, thus far thank you give me 30 more seconds of your time um i've never really bothered to advertise and i don't really plan to but um i do like to highlight extraordinary people and one such person is my niece my niece graduated from ucla law and passed the california bar exam at 18 years old and she's working with a firm that specializes in estate planning. And I think a lot of people are under the impression that you have to be uber rich to do estate planning. And I can assure you that is not the case. The last thing that you want to happen is for the state or the government to decide how to distribute your hard earned assets. So if this topic is of any interest to you, please do reach out to me and I will forward your inquiry to them. And with that, I'm going to conclude this video. As always, thank you for dropping by. I appreciate you. Get out there, have fun, be safe, and I will see you soon on our next adventure. Bye for now.